What's going on, bro? So um, I've been getting a lot of questions about like diagnosing puppy problems, neonatal care. Um, there's a lot of things that I know me and you talk about when it comes to, you know, we get newborn puppies and how we diagnose and, and solve a lot of the issues. Um, so maybe I was thinking we could kind of cover that today. All right, she hit his rocket. So um, the first thing is like, and this is this is the head of a lot of people don't know the head of genetics and reproduction at one of the most respected veterinary schools in the country even told me that vets only get um, eight weeks and up. Exactly. So, so in their syllabus, syllabus, whatever shit it's called, their actual you told me too, actually. Yeah, you told me too. And they're actually curriculum. They don't really start learning. And from eight weeks on age of and up, they don't really get taught like how to tube feed dogs. They don't get taught, you know, how to, I mean, they treat the symptoms just like any other animal because it's a small animal, but some, most of the stuff they learn on the job and they go over it very briefly. You know, it's like the letter A, A, you know what I mean? Now we're on the B, you know what I'm saying? So it's not something they go into depth about. So yeah, it is definitely things that we as breeders should listen to each other because we have more practice in that realm. Yes. And that's all we're trying to do is just, these might not be the exact answers that work for everybody, but these are cases that we've experienced and we've worked through. Exactly. And then yet again, as always with these episodes, we're not your vets guys, but we're just sharing with you guys our life experiences and, and what we've come across with having tons and tons of litters of puppies. So um, I think the first question I get from people is they they contact me and they say, hey, my puppy's not doing too good. Um, what can I do to kind of like, you know, help help save this puppy? Um, I, put up a, I put up a really, really dope article that a vet did write on okay. my website. Remember that article I sent you? And it oh, broke yes. down every little thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes reading is fundamental when it comes to certain things. You know what I'm saying? Like the only reason we, Angel and myself, are in the position that we are in is because, I mean, I have a vast amount of books here and I don't read them all day. Like guys don't think that I sit here all day and just read books. And when something happens, I, I, I just like when you go to the doctors, they treat the symptoms. You tell them the symptoms. So you know the symptoms. You just treat the symptoms. Oh, it's got a fever. Oh, it's not eating. He's lethargic. He's throwing up. He's this. He's he's shitting bloody diarrhea. Like you, you're telling him the symptoms, and because he's so used to hearing the symptoms, he can narrow down what is wrong with the puppy. And yes. you know, it's the same thing that we can do not, not in within our own education level. <laughs> so. You know, that's all we do. You know what I mean? Like if your dog has puppy strangles, if it's got worms, if it's got, you know, upper respiratory infection, if it's got, you know, I've seen it. I promise you, I've seen some crazy stuff. I've seen the puppies born without any anuses. I seen a puppy born with like, um, basically it was worse than umbilical hernia because it was like everything was on the outside of the puppy. Yeah, I've you seen know? that too. I've seen two puppies connected together. Oof, jeez. <laughs> Siamese twins. Oh yeah, but but I've seen, I've seen a, a puppy a, bro, a puppy born like this with no head, oh. and two tails. Yeah, <laughs> it was you know basically supposed to be a bi, you know a, a Siamese twin, but it didn't work out right. Uh, well, yeah. So so and that's and that's the whole thing is that over time as a breeder, you just see different different things and 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 crazy stuff. I mean, you're talking about you know the the birthing process. Anything can happen. So yeah. so like kind of what I was saying is like let's just play the scenario out. So let's just say I have a puppy that's crying really bad. Um, you know, won't stop crying and, and potentially maybe has like some diarrhea or something like that. I'll just use that as an example. It's like mm -hmm. the, fir the first thing I'm typically doing is I'm always checking the temperature. I tell everybody this before they even like hit me up. I'm like, check the temperature of the dog. You know, I know puppies for the first, I think the first week, the first one to two weeks, their temperature is slightly lower. And then I think around by like the third week is when they're like almost at a, like a normal dog's temperature. So, so puppies cannot regulate their own, their own body temperature for they say 
10 to 14 days. That's what the textbook answer says. And if you read some textbooks, it will say two to three weeks is what they will tell you. I've never seen a puppy go three weeks without not being able to regulate their own temperature. So the problem, the thing that you have to do to regulate the temperature, the reason it's important and it's imperative is because it's literally like trying to shit concrete. It just won't happen. So their body needs the heat to keep the organs functioning properly. It's almost yeah. like engine oil. You know, you know, if you live in the cold, I know you live in New York, so yeah. you cannot put just water in your radiator. It will freeze. Yep. yep. So that's why they have antifreeze. So that's the same concept. You've got to keep them warm enough to where their, their, their food is not turning into a concrete. So that's the same reason that the, the medicine, I mean, not the medicine, the same reason that your milk needs to be between 95 and 100 degrees. It is imperative because what goes in cold will stay cold because yes. it can't warm it up. So same thing with you and I. You know, I've been to some trainings when I was in the military. When you're super dehydrated, they tell you to drink warm water, room temperature water, because your body doesn't have to elevate the cold water. So, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's the same concept with dogs. First thing for me, I keep puppies warm in an, either an incubator, on a heating pad, or a, 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 I don't really use heat lamps, but I've used them. I mean, shit, if that's what I got, that's what I'm a rock. You yeah. know what I mean? You keep them warm. And you keep the mom very well fed and just make sure she's dewormed. That's all I do for the first two weeks. You know what I've learned is, uh, well, so <laughs> my mentor is very blunt with the approach, but he, it, it's an acronym that uh, has always resonated with me. And it's, it's called he's up heat, sleep. Um, uh, he put it in a more blunt terms, but I made it an acronym. It's called, uh, he said, heat, sleep, piss, shit. I know uh, he's up. Uh, he, he, I forgot what I changed it to because I didn't want to use those derogatory terms, but he sleep piss shit. And anyway, what it just means is like if the puppy's getting accurate heat, appropriate heat, the puppy's sleeping, not crying all the time. If the puppy's peeing and it looks like a regular, you know, piss color, um, and the, and the poop is coming out, you know, pretty, pretty solid, not no diarrhea or anything like that, you're, you're nine times out of 10, you're going to be golden. Um, a lot of people try to make dogs use the bathroom more than they have to. Uh, fecal matter. Uh, the, hex, the Hexbook answer says it's a dog. The puppy should defecate at least one inch a day. That's what the textbook answer says. I don't I don't make these textbooks up. I'm just telling you what the textbook answer says. Um, that's it should be a certain color. You got to, you know, it shouldn't be white. If it's white, you have an issue. If it's dark, you have an issue. If you get a C-section, let's start off at the very beginning so I can help people. Yeah. I get a lot of people calling in and be like, man, I think my puppy's constipated. My first question I ask anybody, one, did you have a C-section? Yes. Two, do you, are you keeping the puppies warm? Yes. All right, cool. So what I personally do, personally, this is what I do. But, the but minute we, I bring, not, not to cut you off, but before we go even further in that, when you ask the, 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 the heat, right? they should have a way to monitor where the heat is at, correct? Yeah. Yes, I keep my puppies between 90 and 95 degrees. That's just me. So how do you know that? How do you know that they're 90 to 90? I have an incubator. There you go. So I, I just well, want to... Use the, I don't use the incubator uh, if I have to. I don't really prefer incubators. They're not my thing. Gotcha. You know, I, think they, I think they breed bacteria personally. But, and I clean the shit out of it. Hmm. You know, you got six puppies in this little box. They got to use the bathroom somewhere, you know what I mean? Especially if you're keeping them warm enough, they're going to use the bathroom on each other. Or if they're hungry, they're going to suck on each other, you know what I mean? And you have more room, less room, so they can get to each other a lot easier. I do like the really big ones, but they're super expensive. You're talking about like, but, the, um, like the ones you advertise, that joint, big. Yeah, I love that. expensive, and though. And it's I, nice. It's, it's nice because that whole tray comes out. You can properly disinfect it, put it back in. Like, they're not really climbing on the wall. Space is the most important thing, you know what I mean? And most of the, your uh, incubators are about the size of a small television screen. You know, they're only, what, 13 by 13? They're small. You put eight puppies in it. That's a lot of puppies in a little ass box. Yep. So, but, you know, if you had a C-section, I personally, first thing I do is I get a syringe, I mean, I know this is a pen, but I get a syringe of warm, soapy water, baby shampoo, I use baby shampoo, and I just, whoosh, I give them an animal. And that, it's called macromium. After a C-section? Yes, the puppies get a 
um, I give them a, a basically an enema. It's a warm. I've had people call me and be like, man, I think I'm pumping up. I said warm. I didn't say hot. You know what I mean? It, you, yeah. It's got to be warm to the touch. Don't do cold water. Don't do hot water. You can't put your hand in the water. And you just, and I promise you, don't be looking at the book because it's going to come out. And you'll get that nice, thick macromium, that really dark stool that comes out in the very beginning because um, natural birthing process, when they come in through the birth canal, it squeezes it out. Mm -hmm. You are having a C-section, so you need to get it out. And it's it's pretty thick. I know you've seen that really dark tar yep. Yep. like school, the very first one. It's called yep. macromium. I think it's the word. Yeah. And if you uh, or mar marconium or something like that. I, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yep, yep, yep. If y'all looking for me to get grammatically <laughs> correct, you got the wrong motherfucker. <laughs> so but <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you what it is. It is the dark, you know, nasty poop in the beginning. I just get warm soapy water, I shoot it up there, and I just it comes out like a rocket. I never even thought of there, I leave them alone, you know what I mean? I never thought of doing that. Like I've only done it like as needed because they've usually just done it themselves, but that makes a lot of sense. And I'm probably going to implement that moving forward. But uh, back to what you were saying, like when I have puppies on the way, honestly, like something like this is like my best friend. I use something like this and I use this to check the temperature of like the milk and stuff like that. Like, like even in the incubator, because it allows you to, you know, uh, the, this little infrared, oh, it's dead. This little infrared, um, uh thermometer so i'll use this on my like, surfaces if i want to know like for example in the incubator i'm questioning something I'll, I'll i'll trigger it and and check the temperature on the floor of the incubator or the milk itself like i said i'll hold the the can like this and and, and hit the milk and see if the temperature is accurate like i'm I, when i have newborn puppies i'm using this for everything obviously you can't use it on the puppies but everything else you can you know essentially use it on so this is like my best friend during that time um, so i mean i do that that's the very first thing that I do. And then the second thing I do is make sure they're warm. I am not one of them puppies. I mean, uh, I'm not one of them breeders. It just immediately try to get them fuckers sucking on the mom. I try to get them in the incubator for at least 30 minutes to warm them up, to get them to good temperature. Because if they can get that very first uh, <clears throat> bowel movement in a nice warm body, we're good. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I do it. I warm them up immediately. If I'm doing natural births, um, I put them in the incubator after the mom's done cleaning them. And normally, they're pretty warm. They dry out within like five to eight minutes normally. You know what I mean? Because she done did a great job. That's how I do it. And then I just make sure that they have the bathroom break. And then I put them on their mom. I feel like another problem. So it's funny because we're actually kind of going through the acronym. So heat, we covered heat to a degree. And like I said, you guys got to make sure you have a way to monitor it. You know, something that gives you numbers, not you're, you're not like I had somebody tell me, oh, well, I have my apartment set at 80 degrees. I'm like, uh... but you can have fans on, you know, and I was always taught breeze kills puppies. That's what they used to tell me. A breeze will kill a puppy because then it'll turn their stomach to stone. And then you have whining puppies or you have really rock hard stomachs or you'll hear puppies. Yeah. That's because they're, 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 their stools getting too hard for them to pass. And, um, so then the next thing I do at two weeks old, I worm, you know what I mean? But I also, in the whole process, I know the mom has to go outside. She has to come back in. I clean the mom's breast or teats, whatever you want to call them. When she comes back in with wipes. So she doesn't get mastitis. I keep an eye on the mom as well. I keep the temperature. You know, when she just recently gave birth, even after a C-section, stress levels are going to raise her temperature. Yes. She's allowed to have a temperature of 102, all the way up to 103. It wouldn't be concerned at 103 for a small sheer, you know, small period of time. Now, if you're going two, two days and she's still at 103, you might have a little bit of an issue. Average uh, temperature for a dog shouldn't exceed 102.5. Once you go over that, you have a low-grade fever is what they would tell you. But you can be at that point, 2.5 to uh, 103 for about six to eight hours because of the stress. That's mm. completely normal. And, 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 and that's that leads to so, so two things. The first thing is exactly what you said about cleaning the teats and stuff, keeping things sanitary. That's huge. Like, that will save, like you guys tons and tons of heartache and, and headache 
and actually that leads me to um a little trick that i was taught but i don't want to show the label because this isn't the right bottle um but it's just oh, chlorhexidine but you don't want to use the gluconate everybody buys the gluconate on amazon you need to buy the desitate if you buy the desitate you can dilute it and you dilute it because the desitate is the same one that they use for oral mouthwash so if you dilute it you can uh ah man i i wish i had the exact i forget the um the ratio i have it written down but long story short is you can dilute it and you dilute it down with water i think this makes like i think like 42 gallons, gallons like that like but, but but you dilute it you with can clean all your utensils with that too all exactly your, if, you do, yep. if you do dew claws you can clean your utensils with that if you do your own tails you can clean it with that because because this is like the one on amazon everybody buys is gluconate but you don't want this you want to desiccate for if you're cleaning the nipples and you and you dilute it and i just use baby wipes <laughs> but they right there by the floor but you know what it is, is is the lifespan on the desiccate i believe it's like up to see i think like something like a hydrogen peroxide or an iodine i think is only hours that like the the what's the word like like the antimicrobials and like basically killing off everything like it only lasts for a few hours and then obviously yeah. microorganisms can come back onto onto the just like bleach everything everybody thinks bleach kills everything it does but it has to stay wet for 15 minutes you exactly. might want to make a small print yep so you know what i mean where that kind of stuff it kills this you know kennesaw and your your spray it kills this stuff faster and it doesn't have to sit on it for 35 minutes before it's dead you know what i mean exactly with the desitate from what i remember i think it it lasts on the female's tits for up to like 72 hours or something like that from what i remember so that's why well, it makes sense because the puppies are going to suck on it too so that's yeah. why the oral one's probably, probably a lot better i, I honestly just use baby wipes um, Straight um, no, yeah, baby wipes work too i mean um like I said, I like that for like the antimicrobial effect and so on and so forth. And honestly, since I've been doing that, I really haven't had any issues with puppy like coccidia, giardia, stuff like that, as well as, you know, staying on top of deworming. And that leads to another thing. I've been using this dewormer now. Um, and I mean, like, th this has been bomb. I know you, we were talking about this. I don't even think you can really do it in the U.S. But for puppies, like yeah. this. Toronto in the U.S. Bomb. Uh, they don't recommend Dronto in the U.S. till over eight weeks, so it's a waste in their mind because puppies technically can only really get roundworms and hookworms until a certain age because there's no gestation period for them. Let's put it this way: I had a buddy a small gestation period. But let's let's put it this way: like I I I know people like I've seen on Instagram and stuff like that that had, after I after I shared that I started using this, and literally like I think like the past the past five litters that I saw on online, like all their puppies had worms. Like they were shitting out worms once they used this, once they switched to this. Because like, I, I, like I said, I think, I, cause this has pyrental and praziquental in it. I don't think it has fendibendazole in it. Uh, that's what makes it the puppy version. But mm -hmm. like I said, like since using this, every time the puppies shit out worms. So I, I love it. That That's what I switched to. But, but um, back to what we were talking about, so another thing is once we got the heat squared away, right? Uh, heat, eat, sleep, piss and shit. The eating thing, right? What I find that a lot of people make mistakes and I've learned for, my, for myself is mixing up the food because of the fact that maybe mom isn't producing enough milk. I've found that I was in a situation where I gave, say like a goat's milk and then I went from a goat's milk and I was like, you know what? Let me do the, the homemade recipe because they're a little bit older, whatever. But, that's the biggest mistake I've learned, at least, that you can make is is giving them different formulas. When you stick with one, like when you pick one, you got to ride through it with that. I here's, mean, what, here's, here's what I tell people. Like for me, there's a lot of things that we skipped over. If you have a small litter, so say you have three puppies or less. So that's one, two or three. You have to be careful of stuff like, uh, you know, when your puppies go flat chested, if they go flat chested from being too fat and eating too much. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll start struggling to breathe. You'll see them, they look like they're hyperventilating. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, what it is, is the rib cage is, it's still forming. It's actually still floating is yeah. what they say. So it's, it's, it's going like this, instead of staying concaved to where the, the lungs can expand inside the, the rib cage, you're going flat. So now the, 
the lungs are barely expanding like this now and they're <laughs> like suffocating so if you have that yeah they're suffocating slowly it's almost like if you ever done any kind of workouts and they i was gonna say <laughs> you start choking <laughs> yourself out you know? yeah. but like i don't know how to explain it to you i mean I, no i mean like when i was in some of the trainings that i did in the service they would anyway so the thing is is a lot of people don't understand is that it's easy to fix if you can catch a lot of things early the key yeah. is being observant that's it anything can be fixed almost if you can catch it if you can catch it early enough if it's coccidia that's usually the puppies are oily feeling they have white stool if they have puppy strangles they have little knots nodules behind their ears or on their lower underneath their jaw it can be fixed if you get uh, flat chested, the chest like this, it's easy. You literally just take the fucking puppy, roll it like this, just to concave its chest back and get blue painters tape, and wrap it around. That's all I do. Well, for the flat chest, so with, with my brief- I've seen people do that weird, you're going to say with the PVC pipe? You can use the PVC pipe, like with our breed, for example, well, my breed, for example, we get it really bad. Like, like- Yeah, try, can... listen, try painters tape. You're going to be like, yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> Blue painter stick, and it don't rip no hair off. What, what we do is we like there's a harness that you can purchase now that mm -hmm. like it is like the PVC kind of thing. But like I remember, like basically what we'll use is just to prevent it overall is just putting a soft and extremely soft and a lumpy surface from the beginning, and then you don't really have to worry as much. So in the incubator, we'll use like the egg. What do they call it? Egg crate or egg foam or whatever. Yeah, egg crate. You don't want the puppy laying flat on its stomach at all times. You try to want to lay it on its side. You want him to lay it on its back. If he lays on his stomach from side to from time to time, it's okay. But you would prefer to have one arm underneath at least. You know, so that's what I tell people. When they're laying on hard surfaces, flat, yeah, they can go flat chested. But it's normally, or there's another, there's another thing you can do. If you notice the puppies are getting extremely fat, take mom out, leave her out some. Make them, make them move around more because they're getting too fat. I mean, I know fat puppies are healthy puppies and all that kind of stuff. They look great. I love them too. Don't get me wrong. But when they get too fat and they can't move their own back legs, and you got swimmers. Now we're talking about having problems in the back. You know, it's all about moderation. Everything's good in moderation. I don't have any problem with somebody being super skinny or super obese. I don't care. But when we're talking about an infant or we're talking about an adult, you know, a, a two-year-old that's three, you know, we'll just say a two-year-old weighs 87 pounds. Well, child services is coming for your ass. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So same thing with a newborn puppy. If you got this really fat-ass puppy, look, bro, it might look good, but you're gonna, it's going to be fucked up. Yep, yep. Uh, can't, I, have a, I had a puppy downstairs, and it was really, really fat. And the first thing I did when I just got, literally, I just got home, you know that? I said, oh, nah, he eating one time today. I got to yeah. slim you down. He's walking around his belly. And and just back to what we were saying, so so the puppy should be sleeping either on like their side or their belly's facing up, correct? Because yeah, if they can, they can even sleep on their stomach from time to time, but you kind of want a leg underneath of the stomach. You don't want them laying like this. This is what you don't want: hands to the sky, uh, feet to the rear. Even if they have their feet underneath of them and they're laying like this, you're okay. But you don't want the complete flat legs one way, arms the other, flat on his chest. That's gonna all that weight's just gonna make that rib yeah, cage go exactly. flat like this instead yep. of concave like that and that's so why that's a, that oh no i was just gonna say that that's why i kind of switched from like originally i started doing heat lamps then i went to the heating pads right and then heat lamps here's why i can tell you why you didn't stop doing heat lamps you started dehydrating puppies yep yeah when you dehydrate a puppy it is one of the hardest things to fix so I tell people, they be like, why do you keep your puppies at 90 degrees? Well, I just make sure that I don't try to dehydrate them. If I notice that I walk in there and I look in the incubator and I see them with their mouth open, not panting, because puppies really don't pant. If they're panting, you're fucked. Yeah. But if their mouth is open, you see them with their mouth open, I'll turn the heat down. Yep. You know, I'll turn it down to like 85. You know what I'm saying? So that's another thing you have to pay attention to. Too much heat dehydrates you dehydrates puppies and when you dehydrate a puppy it is really freaking hard to rehydrate a puppy i try to tell people too like i don't know about you but it's like what i've learned is there is no perfect temperature 
each litter is going to be different because like you can't you can't use the same temperature on some great dane puppies versus the same temperature as some chihuahua puppies is two completely different things you know what I'm saying? even within the same breed you know i've, yeah, had- I've seen i've seen moms have different milk like legitimately fat richie milk and you've had moms with lean milk like almost with it seems like their puppies are healthy but they're not gaining they're not fat they don't yeah. have fat on their body so i've seen it all in all different breeds so you know the thing is, is if you're observant that's what i tell people if you're observant you the dog is at least you have the dog has decent heat he's dry you see defecations you see him peeing and he's eager to eat you're good leave it alone let mother nature take its course you know what i mean but there's other things that we can step in like you said we can monitor the heat we can monitor them using the bathroom we can monitor their food intake if they're getting too fat and we can pay attention to stuff like if they have worms, if their neck is sunken and they have a big old fat stomach where they just ate half the food bowl. Yeah, a visual object. A sign of worms. Oh, I remember what the acronym now was. Yeah, it was it was heat, eat, um, sleep, and then urine, and then poop. You know, he's up. That's what I tell people. And as long as you're visually, obviously looking at the dogs. And, and that was another thing that, like, my mentor had told me is, like, when you're holding the puppies, when you're doing things with the puppies, say you're feeding them, whatever the case may be, like, don't just be holding them and be like, oh, this is a fire puppy. Like, every time you pick up the puppies, it should be for a reason. Whether you're in, in examining, like you said, the, the neck or anything that looks out of the norm, there should always be purpose to what you're doing when you're holding the puppies. It shouldn't just be, yeah. oh, look at this fire I got puppy. a puppy back one time. This is a true story. I got a puppy back. Sorry, man. I just got to tell the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah go my, ahead. <laughs> I'm talking to the dude who sent me the puppy. Okay. Now, obviously, it was a jet black puppy, so I couldn't see everything. I mean, yeah. he was far away. The dog shows up. Yeah, the cleft lip. Oh. I said, Bro, you know, this puppy got a minor cleft lip. I mean, I put it in the pet home, but he was like, nah, I didn't even notice. Either one, you really didn't notice and you lying. You know, you didn't touch the puppies. Or two, you lying. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. how do you miss a whole cleft lip? Yeah. So, you know, when born, we check because I breed bulldogs, so we check for cleft palates. So I literally put my fingers in their mouth and I hit rock their head back to see if they got any holes in the roof of their mouth. Gotcha. If they got a hole, if they got a hole in the roof of their mouth, I'm sorry, anybody want PETA and all that. I leave them at the vet's office. I just do because I've tried this. It's just it's not it's just pretty it's gruesome. You know what I mean? They just all the snot and all the milk comes out the nose. Yeah, I tell and, you. Oh, I'll say what you're gonna say. I'm sorry. I was gonna say, and that one puppy normally makes the mom on edge. Imagine having twins and one always crying. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh my god, he's crying again. I gotta get up. Oh, he's crying again. I gotta get up. Or if you just had two perfect, healthy babies, that, all right, it's feeding time. Oh, he's quiet. He's not hungry. So yeah. it's the same thing. You know what I mean? So when you bring home those kind of messed up puppies with cleft lips or cleft palates. You do run the risk of having an anxious mom. Yeah, yeah. And an anxious mom is kind of a scary thing sometimes because she'll do. I mean, I've seen some anxious moms kind of like, I guess you could say borderline, like go crazy. Like I, I see well, not some- only that though, you would think that anxiousness keeps them on edge. How long do you want to stay on edge? And then like day eight, they just collapse and they'll squish anything because they're so tired of trying to mentally be ready for this puppy. And that day eight, they just literally can't take it anymore. And they just, and they don't even care. There's a puppy under them. You know what I mean? And and I, I also tell people too, like, I've seen it time and time again, where they want to play the good Samaritan and try to save the cleft uh, palate puppy. But oftentimes, like, especially the more novice breeder, they go through all the heartache and all the hassle of trying to keep that puppy surviving just for it to wind up passing away anyway, because a cleft palate puppy is really not something for the novice breeder. Um, so you went through all the heartache. You went through all the, like, you made it worse now because you you worked so hard to keep this thing alive and that it passed on you. Um, it was like you could have avoided all that heartache. And then, and, and it makes it, the heartache worse because you, you put all that time and energy into that puppy. And then the yeah. other thing, the other side of the coin is let's say they do get that puppy to survive. Where are you placing that puppy? Because now, you have a, a a puppy with a cleft palate and and who's going to like now you have to find a home for that special needs dog you know so it it becomes it, it's just a, a very tricky situation so yeah i i know plenty of breeders who they they're kind of like that's a defect we don't want that we don't even want the chance of that being passed on or along in any kind of lines or anything like that so they they leave it at the vet's office 
I just leave my defense off. I'm not, I, don't, I know Peter can come after me. It is what it is. But, you know, I let them do what they do. Um, that's that's your newborn. So that's what I do. And then, then from there, at two weeks, I worm. Four weeks, I worm. Six weeks, I worm. Eight weeks, I worm. I worm every two weeks. I know people are like, well, you're OD. Well, it is what it is. I give Neopar at four weeks, personally. And then I take them to the vet at eight weeks. What do you feel like is the best indicator that your puppies are doing good? Like, what what do you think? Happy, and they're gaining weight. Yeah. When oh, that's a big food, weight gain. We didn't even really talk about that, but yeah. When you're putting good. food down, we'll just say when you put mom in there, they attack her. When um, here's a here's a little trick I will tell people: if you have a five week old puppy, you've taken her off mom, and she's you know a little lethargic. Um, Here's a little secret I'll tell you. You can put them back on their mom. That antibodies that they can get from their mom is better than antibody, almost any antibody you can give. I've had a puppy that was like knocking on death's door that I called the vet and I was like, all right, I'll bring her in. And he says, here, I'll put her on Clavamox, but put her on mom as well. And I promise you, I put that puppy on the mom. I think she was like five weeks old. Mom barely had any milk. And within two days, that puppy was acting like nothing was wrong again. Wow. A lot of people don't know that, that you can put the puppy back on the mom, you know, and you'll see a huge improvement on that puppy. So it makes so, a huge difference. I don't know why. I don't know what it does. I don't know if it's, you know, the antibodies that they can still get because they can, they're still on their mom's immune system. If you're going to, if you, you can figure it out yourself, you can do a tighter test. I think a tiger test. I don't know how to say it, but it will tell you exactly when you should start vaccinations because they're still on their mother's immunity. It's normally between four and eight weeks. So, so that's why, uh, and, and back to what you were saying, like, like, and, and for me, like what I'm looking for that tells me that the puppies are doing good is like when they're, when they're nice and quiet and sleeping. When I see that they're getting nice sleep, they're not crying. And obviously the weight thing, weight thing, those are the two biggest things that tell me, all right, my puppies are good especially seeing them go up in weight. And I weigh them in grams because visually, like you can't see if a puppy lost 10, 10 grams. I do grams when they're young. Yeah. Yeah. When they're, yeah. When they're young, when they're first born, I'm doing grams. And that's what tells me that they're that seeing that consistent weight gain tells me that they're doing good now. So two problems well, let's cover real quick uh, around that five week mark. Right. Cause I had somebody ask me this the other day. What do you think as far as if you have a puppy that's throwing up, Let's say you're trying to get them to go to mush or something like that, and you have a puppy that's throwing up. I've what? only seen that one breed, and it was a Frenchie. I don't know what it is with Frenchies. They have a I, hard time switching from I mom to food. Man. I don't know. I've actually had to give one um, Serenia because it was so bad. Wow. Was like, what that's what I that's what I told him. I said if it was my if it was my dog, I'd probably just switch it. I'd probably give him Serenia. That I, I like yeah. I said I had a, a friend that who was. I don't asking, know what it, was it a Frenchie. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what it is about Frenchies, man, but up. weaning Frenchies is the weirdest I've ever seen, and I've never seen that problem in any other breed but Frenchies. Yeah, Frenchies, especially where they're at right now in their breed, they have a lot of crazy problems. Um, now let's so all right, here's here's one of the most common problems we could cover real quick is um usually like diarrhea, the poops, you know, the different types of poops and stuff like that. Diarrhea being one of the biggest ones. Um, what do you usually do when you see a puppy that has diarrhea? Well, depending on how old it is, if it's a young, young puppy, I just give it a liquid metric. I was, I was going to say that, like under three to five weeks, like say it's the first couple weeks of life. So I, under three weeks when it's still on the mom, I give it liquid metro just to stop the diarrhea. If it's over three weeks old and it's on kibble um, or on a mush, I give it more pumpkin. If it's got diarrhea and it's not eating properly, not, not well. I'll just say not properly. It's not eating well. I'll go 24 hours without any food to the stomach. Mm. No, it's not going to kill the puppy, but it will clean the system completely out, and maybe that will reset it. Now, like I told you, I am a big advocate of Tylon powder. Yeah. This is what they give puppies, or this is what they give dogs for what they call garbage gut. Basically, they don't know what's wrong, and it's nothing more than a little cheap powder. that you just It ain't cheap, but it's just powder that I sprinkle on top of their food. I do it all the time. And then the, some medication. Yeah, it helps diarrhea. And it also does it's subsidiary, I think is the word, like where it does something else. It okay. also cures coccidia. Mm, wow. So, so, yeah, so 
I, I do something similar to that effect. Like for me, if it's even the first couple weeks of life, I'll give them pumpkin. I've I've given them a little dab of pumpkin on the roof yeah. of their mouth. And it's it's helped. It's worked for me as far as trying to help kind of like solidify the stool, especially when it is diarrhea, because if I see diarrhea and, and it's diarrhea for too long or too often, like I'm also worried about the puppy getting dehydrated. So I may take, you know, I may take a, a lactated ringer like this and just, you know, put some underneath the puppy's skin, you know, um, I may take a, a lactated ringer, put some underneath the puppy's skin just to keep them hydrated. Um, and then what I'll usually use is if I'm doing a medicine, like if, if, if it doesn't go after the first couple feedings with the, with the, with the pumpkin, um, I'll, I'll probably give like a, an Albon or like, uh, there's a liquid, uh, supplement, supplement, and trimethoprin, which is like SMZs. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll give that. And what I found is that kind of helps with the, the tract, you know what I'm saying? As far as like, oh. so, I mean, you could do stuff like, um, there's other stuff you can do. Pepto-Bismol. Um, you think that's yeah, what I was going to tell you. Some Pepto-Bismol has aspirin in it. Okay. So you have to be careful. Um, there's, a there's another medicine that they give horses. It's like Pepto-Bismol. Gina, what's that? Oh, she's got the door closed. There is a, it's, it's pink too. I forget what it's called, but I'll send you a picture of it so you can add it to the comments or something. But yeah, I just give them a little bit of that. Or, I mean, I, I don't immediately go to Metro, but if I'm really, really busy, I give them Metro just because I can, you know, I know it will stop it and the stomach will be okay. It yeah. can handle it. Or you can worm the puppy. A lot of people, you'll tell, you'll talk to some old school people. They'll be like, oh, I'll just hit them with some worm medicine. <laughs> and shit works somehow. I don't know how, but it works. But, yeah, you know, I mean, they might just keep their stomachs upset. I've seen a, a thousand different things work. I, the only thing I can tell you is learn how to treat your symptoms. From every time you have a symptom, write it down and remember, because you're not going to remember every single thing you've ever done in dog breeding. So yeah. when you have an issue like a runny nose, runny nose will lead to either clear, is it green, is it yellow snot? You know, these are the three different things that you have to know. And so what did you do? Did you give it doxycycline? Did you give it SMZ? Did you give it, you know, you know, same thing applies with neonatal. It's the same thing a vet does. Every time they have a problem, they take a mental note. So the next time they know the answer. It's the yeah. same concept for us guys. So anytime you have an issue, make sure you write it down, get a little book, get a little journal and just write everything down and just say, Hey, you guys, look, last time I had runny stool like this, it was white. It was, you know, it came out to be cox. Yeah, it came out to be coccidia. All right, so how do you fix coccidia? All right, you can do this, this, or this. You can do, you know, you can do worm. You can do panic here for three to seven days. Yeah, you know I, mean, I mean, or you can do tortazerol, or you can do Albon, or you can, you know, what I mean, like you have to write all this stuff down because you're never going to remember it all until you're 20 years in or 15 years in. You might remember it all. Even then, you won't remember it all. But that's why it's people like me and. Angel, we connect because steel sharpens steel. Hey, man, I got this going on. I ain't never seen it. Oh, yeah, I had that happen last week. All you got to do is this, this, and this. Yep, yep. And, and, and that's why, like, in my opinion, like, the moral of the story is, especially with puppies, you have to be proactive. Don't wait till it gets to a certain point. They're not, like, they're not, I don't even consider newborn puppies dogs. Like, to me, they're like little vegetables. Like, you have to be proactive because unlike an adult dog, the puppy's not going to get skinny. By the time it gets skinny, it's already dead. Like you, you can't wait that long. And by going to the vet, at least in my experience, what I've learned is by going to the vet, um, oftentimes they just give me like a Clavamox or something. And, and they're just not, at, they're not as adamant about keeping the puppy alive as maybe I would be, you know, they, 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 they're limited on the knowledge, at least in my experience, every time I went to the vet. So I kind of stopped going. And then I found by my own personal experience, I was keeping the puppies alive. So, um, like I said, guys, you have to be proactive. So anyway, we're limited on time. So, uh, hopefully this information was helpful, is useful, and, uh, we'll see y'all on the next episode. Peace. All right, guys. Peace.